Our next presenter is uh, Jesse Brandenburg from Intel. Jesse has been contributing to the networking and kernel community for quite some time. I distinctly remember walking through Toronto on a cold day with him talking about uh, busy polling, and that's a feature we, we have, and he was telling me how great it was and what kind of performance he was getting, and Jesse is also very in tune with uh, what kind of problems people run into with driver development, because uh, from their perspective, they've submitted a lot of drivers, they've worked a lot upstream, and they know where the pain points are. So his perspective is extremely valuable, and I appreciate that. So uh, without further ado, Jesse. Thanks, Dave, for the nice introduction. <laughs> so we'll get started. Thanks for coming today. I know everybody's got a nice full belly, so it'll be nice and quiet, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I won't say anything if we hear snoring, I promise. So we're going to talk today about uh, network offloads, in particular uh, networking hardware offloads. And uh, just a quick note, um, all the photos in this presentation were uh, Creative Commons licensed, so go open source kind of licenses. Today we're going to talk about um, a brief history of offloads, the, the hardware kind of that we have today, um, some of the offloads and problems that we have seen coming and gone, and uh, a couple of proposals for uh, what I think can, can happen um, going forward for the networking kernel and uh, for device drivers in general for uh, network cards. So me, um, I'm Jesse Brandenburg. Uh, my co-speaker, uh, Anjali, couldn't make it to the conference this year. So uh, it's just me. You could enjoy me the whole time. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Intel. Uh, I've been with Intel for 25 years, um, working on future products and uh, a big open source proponent within our group and our company. So let's start off with a little bit of history, right? We started with offloads way, way back when. Do you guys remember when there was only one net dev and one external port, and maybe if you were lucky, you saved a few CPU cycles by offloading your checksums and maybe TSO if you were lucky, right? So uh, it, it all began with a small set, right? What do offloads do? They, uh, they help you save your CPU from doing work. So back in the day, we had a file called include Linux net device .h, and it had support for just a couple basic offloads from particularly our cards, but a lot of other people too, scatter gather, um, doing IP checksum offload and hardware checksum offload. So kind of an interesting thing back then, you would say, I can do, uh, I can insert an IP checksum in the header, that's great. IP checksums are easy, they're nice and short, always pretty much the same. Hardware checksum, you, the flag used to say, I'll just advertise, I can checksum anything. <laughs> there was no differentiation. You just said it was an on-off flag. I can check some or I can't in hardware. So it was an interesting uh, uh, start, right? But at the time, it seemed perfect. So as we go through here, you might notice a little bit of a theme. If you know me, you know I like cars. Um, so we'll continue with the theme as we go through. So history continues, right? Good thing, time moved on. Uh, we had more offloads. There was uh, especially 8021Q VLAN insert and delete. Um, it seemed like a great offload. There's a whole other module for it. And we added transfer segmentation offload. The initial implementations were spewed all over the kernel stack, right? From top to bottom, every single element in the entire chain had to change. Um, these offloads, uh, as we went on, and got more and more uh, heavyweight and stack changes were necessary and they had big impacts to the stack. I mean, I, we had lots of TSO bugs and things that we went through at the very beginning. It was uh, not a great uh, bunch of fun. So the, uh, the TSO, and it's been talked about in other contexts in this, uh, in this form already today, um, big gain in speed in CPU. Uh, the speed comes from the hardware doing most of the segmentation work, so things only move through the stack one time. Uh, the bigger gain is that you reduce your CPU, right? Because the CPU isn't doing um, repeated trips up and down a big, long uh, instruction pipeline trying to get packets out on the wire. Um, however, I have to say, you know, thanks to Eric for writing GSO, um, the final revision, it seems like, of our uh, 
TCP segmentation offload um, that supports both software and hardware offloads. And it's much cleaner now, right? All the logic moved down to the very top layer, mostly just above the driver, and the segmentation can happen there. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, TSO you know, does segmentation from a huge, big, long buffer with one header and a whole bunch of data and splits it up into a whole bunch of smaller pieces with, of data with uh, the same header replicated and updated as it goes out onto the wire. So these, um, these offloads really help. Uh, they're still super valuable today um, at any given speed because it saves you a bunch of CPU. So, um, you know, it's a work reduction. Uh, and in addition, generally it gives the network adapter cards the ability to transmit at wire speed because you can transmit these frames back to back because the whole, all the data is prepared and waiting for the card. So even more history. Uh, quite a few more offloads were added, right? Most of them are transmit offloads. We do all sorts of stuff um, along the line of uh, tunnels and um, you know, we're, we're starting to see if we can offload the inner and the outer uh, headers on tunnels. We're trying to offload new protocol types. There's, um, we always want these basic offloads like checksum and TSO to uh, be ready for any protocol type, right? We'd like that to work because the hardware is really good at these things and it makes sense to do them at the last minute. It's interesting that even today, uh, CPUs have gone, you know, tens or hundreds of orders of magnitude faster than they used to when I started working on uh, Linux. Um, but the, 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 check, the gain of doing checksums not in the CPU is still huge. There's still a big difference because you'd have to touch every single byte in that frame to recompute that checksum. So having our hardware do it's a good thing. The, the receive offload space is definitely getting um, more now. We're starting to talk a lot more about receive offloads. They change, you know, one of them is the obvious one, which is large receive offload. It's kind of the opposite of TSO, right? Um, uh, the kernel has this thing called GRO now. Uh, that allows the, the stack to reassemble frames and software. Sometimes hardware can also do it um, to reassemble the frames and the hardware and take off the headers and make basically one small header and a whole bunch of data attached to it, even though the MTU on the wire may be quite a bit smaller. So what's happening with offloads now is they're getting a lot more complex, right? We're struggling with um, a lot more moving parts. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute on the next slide. The, 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 the changes are no longer stateless, right? We're moving to these um, offloads that are trying to maintain state, so you end up with more complicated firmware, or you end up with really complicated ASICs, or um, you, know, you try and move work into CPUs that are existing on the NIC. It goes on and on. So the, the other thing that's happening is logical flows for um, are moving down into hardware, like uh, using eBPF programs. So I had to mention it, you know, everybody does seems in this forum. <laughs> Rest assured, that's the only time I mentioned BPF in the whole presentation. Okay, so, and we're also creating new paradigms like uh, TC Flower for vSwitch offload. So the community is doing all sorts of uh, things like trying to make sure that flows can be directed in the right place. We're trying to push drop rules down into hardware. We would like for that stuff to be available and uh, exported easily to user space so that users can use it. So what's happening now, right? The history is past, now we're moving into present day. The, you know, the huge things are coming. These, these are no longer NICs, right? I feel like they're a NIC because I plugged them in to a machine, but they're really SOCs or really complicated beasts. There's FPGAs, they have CPUs, they have onboard RAM, they, they you know, have tons of processing power, they get really hot, and they, you know, <laughs> they need big, huge connections to the, to the um, main memory through the PCI Express bus. We want PCI Express 4 so we can have the, the wider connection, the faster connections. Um, the, the, thing, the other things that are coming, you know, the, the cards of today are, shi are shipping with virtualization support, including um, SRIOV and scalable IOV. There is, uh, you know, like I said before, tunnel offloads, both for TSO and checksum, and as well for doing um, encapsulation and decapsulation in hardware. So imagine you want to communicate um, across a secure tunnel, but you don't want to tell the user space that you're doing that. So you can just transport every, every packet from that uh, network device to the other end and have it all be encrypted um, and uh, in a nice little tunnel. So that kind of offload has already made it into the kernel, right? There's, uh, there's vendors doing this today. There's flow tracking. We're trying to do millions of rules or even counters for flows. 
these offloads are getting complicated. There's a ton of hardware controls in, like for instance, our silicon. There's all these knobs that we can twist and turn, and it's getting really hard to figure out where we can control this or even how you can tell a user how to control it. So that's one of the problems I think we're talking about today is that in general, the, uh, the controls for the kernel are way too um, coarse. So, you know, as another example, like of these huge interfaces, talking about counters, how do you tell a driver to dump one million counters for the one million or 10 million flows or whatever you have uh, every second? You know, I'm, my brain just exploded because, you know, with uh, let's transfer all these counters into Netlink and dump them all, and then what are you going to do with them? How does the hardware move them from the hardware's storage into main memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? It gets really hard to manage. So these interfaces that we have today aren't scaling. That's really the big thing I'm here to talk about, right? Is that, and, and the other thing is that there's really small overlap between vendors as the offloads get bigger and bigger. So we might say that we're doing one thing, but it's not necessarily the same, and it's catching users off guard, and it's not a great, uh, great place for us to be. So... <laughs> You know, it, it feels a little bit like we've gone uh, the, 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 the Bozosuko uh, route with our uh, offloads, right? So this is from uh, the recent i40e driver with a kernel 4.18 and a recent ETH tool. And, you know, I know that it's a bit of an eye chart, but it kind of gives you the idea of the offloads here listed are all over the place, you know, from uh, features inside of scatter gather to whether or not we do TC SCTP segmentation, you know, connecting to a previous presentation. UDP segmentation, uh, hardware TC offload, right? Why is that one there in eTool? Um, so you kind of get the idea. It's, we're building this um, kind of crazy system, and it started out simple, and it made sense, and then it got bigger, and then we all kind of lost it and started building um, things with big exhaust pipes that stick out the back. So you know, we got to be careful about this, right? I think moving forward, we need to be thinking a little bit ahead um, and whether or not we want to try and keep this up, the status quo, or whether we want to try and invent something new. So here we are in the case of option overload. Right? We, when you say ETH tool hardware TC offload, well, what do you mean? Are you going to support any action, any match? How many? You can add a whole bunch of rules, but then the 13,000th one fails, <laughs> um, how do you back out, what happened? It's uh, getting a bit crazy as you start to scale up, right? So we need to, to, to try and figure out how to communicate these interfaces in a clean and concise way, whether that be header files like eBPF is doing or, or something along those lines. Um, the other thing that we've seen out in this space, especially while doing research for this paper, you end up with something like saying, oh yeah, I support feature X in the kernel. And then each vendor writes 30 pages of documentation that describes how to use that feature X on their hardware. And it doesn't apply really to anybody else's hardware. It's very specific to that vendor's hardware, even though it's a kernel feature that's supposedly generic and it's uh, putting us in a bad spot. both as vendors and as an open source community. Because we want our users to be happy, right? <laughs> All of us. So the other thing I wanted to mention here on this slide is the granularity uh, problem, right? The, the vendors have controls and the kernel has controls and they don't necessarily match in capability very well. And there isn't a, a nice, uh, you know, if, if I had to add a feature to ETH tool for every single hardware feature that our hardware supported, Dave would just say no, because it's all about our hardware, right? And we've heard this story repeatedly. So we're trying to get into the space where we can find something that will help us describe what we can do and um, have a good hope of having a user be able to use it without having to call us and say, huh, what do I have to do now? So how many of these overlap with each other? And this actually someone, I think you mentioned earlier today, and tuple rules from ETH tool, 
wait, those are the same or are they different than the TC rules? Wait, what about DevLink? Um, I'm confused. What about U32? You know, it's this problem of how do I program my interface? Should I pick all of them? Should I support all of them as a vendor? Um, we, what's happened also to the market is that we're seeing is that the market is bifurcating badly, right? People want one thing um, over here and, and customers want another thing over here. And it's really hard as a vendor to try and figure out what you should do for defaults, what you should support for interfaces, because uh, who knows what people are going to run. The open source stacks are getting very tall, <laughs> as we've seen in some of the other presentations. and. Um, like I asked earlier today in one of the BPF presentations, what, what do you do for a hardware offload if you want to get support for it into the kernel? Because maybe the kernel is able to, to save cycles uh, by, by pushing the work down into some dedicated piece of hardware. And unfortunately, as much as I'd like to say it, the, the world seems to have moved to offloads versus um, CPU work, right? No matter how fast we make the CPUs, and no matter how many dedicated instructions we add for tasks, there's always someone that comes up with an offload that's quicker or uh, hardware that can do a dedicated task in a better way. So one thing to mention here um, is, right, we, should we just keep adding to these interfaces in all of them? Um, I don't know. I don't think that's the right answer. The, you know, so we've, like I said in the previous slides, we've done the same thing over and over again. I challenge the community to kind of start coming up with something new. Let's look forward a little bit and see if we can figure out how to arrange this so that everybody benefits. One thing that I did spot is that there's this new parameter option that came since I submitted this paper's uh, abstract. This param option came to DevLink. This is a possible way of moving forward, but I'm not sure that it solves all of our problems. I'll talk about that in a little bit. See, that's not us. <laughs> So one point, it's a little bit out of the, the flow of the presentation, but I wanted to point it out. The net devs are no longer the external ports, right? It, it, it's kind of been this way for a long time, but um, you know, if you have VLANs or you have a stacked interface or you have um, containers, you, know, you have all sorts of options that give you uh, control over the network, but they're not necessarily dedicated to the external ports anymore. So we've graduated, right? We've gone from this place where we had a really simple interface and simple offloads, and we've moved on into these great big behemoths with a bazillion interfaces and a bazillion controls and a bunch of hardware support that's all different from every vendor. So the problem, right? We end up with Mad Max. Um, the <laughs> The organically grown solutions right, that we've done uh, worked well. I think they're still working. We're kind of just hanging on by the, by the, by the fingernails. Uh, but are we designing what we really want to achieve? So that's my question open to you, right? Are we really going the place that we want to end up? So if we aren't, we should try and aim, right? It's not going to be perfect. We readjust constantly. But we should try and aim forward, I think, um, at least two or three years, try and figure out what's coming and try and figure out how the kernel interfaces will work to absorb these changes that are coming. So we have a big challenge ahead of us, right? The old models don't fit. We need to come up with a kernel method of expressing these things. You know, should we migrate all to the DevLink dev param to let us control stuff? It's still too coarse, even though it's brand new and it lets you control some things about the hardware its main uh, interface point is the PCI Express bus device and function. So you're expressing, I would like some control over this bus device and function to do things a specific way and pass some parameters to it, but it's still not enough. We have SRIOV devices, we have virtual interfaces, we have VLANs, we have um, Mac VLAN, we have you know, bridges, and they're all uh, capable of being done in our hardware. Um, and we need to be able, to, and especially coming, there's things about parsers and um, and rules, right, that use those parsers that we can do in our hardware in future generations or current generations, and we can't express that to users. So here's my idea, right? We got to figure out a way to do generic offload expression. You know, how do you describe a car with spots in a generic way, right? <laughs> You know, it doesn't, uh, 
It's not something that you would typically have when you're describing a car. Same thing for our network cards, right? We have a car. Everybody's like, you have a NIC, but it's not really a NIC. It's a NIC with spots. Um, so the, the one way of going forward with this is to do something like, uh, like we've talked about with BTF or um, name value pairs, the, something that helps the hardware and the driver self-describe itself in a way that users can then query and find out about what the hardware can do. So this is actually becoming a common theme after sitting here for a couple days. Um, I've started to see this idea right coming to fruition in several other forms. So I'm wondering how we can help use those examples as ways that we can go forward in a generic way for offloads for networking cards. I don't know. We need an N. My, my slide got marfed somehow. So, uh, you know, we need a new way of doing these things. We need a... You know, maybe we can move also, once we get this uh, infrastructure in place that's generic enough, we can have a nice library and Netlink interface that gives you control over the whole thing. Um, so that if you are an advanced user, for instance, in a data center, you can um, control your hardware in a way that makes sense. So I pretty much told you what I think. The offload infrastructure code is needed really badly. We, uh, we've reached this point where we have these crazy complicated offloads, um, and I think we can do better trying to express them. You know, the option that we have right now is kind of the way that we're defaulting to, which is that we have no implementation or control at all, right? So maybe vendor X upstreams a feature that they want that day for one customer, and then you get an extra control added to ETHL. Is this what we want to do if you times that by 1,000? we're going to end up with this weird scenario um, that won't result in uh, a pleasing solution at the end. And that's what we all want, right? It's easy to maintain code, easy interfaces for users. So, so uh, <laughs> I bet Dave has an opinion. I may. Uh, you have to realize that we're in the situation we're in now because the kernel is constantly struggling to find this abstraction that does two things. First, it allows to express what a piece of hardware can do, but is also trying to do so in a way that is useful for users. Right. So we kind of try to predict how things are going to go. We come up with an abstraction like TC Flower or what have you as an example, and then we implement it for one person or two drivers, and then device set A wiggles a little bit this way and device set B wiggles a little bit that way right. and then there's no full coverage from the original abstraction that we created. So we're constantly in this fix up mode where we're like, okay, now we gotta go through this process all over again and what have you. But so we have this big complicated situation because things are implicitly complicated. Yes, yeah, we, we're growing a complicated ecosystem. We just gotta figure exactly. out how we wanna and, do it. And there's different needs and it's never completely clear to what extent the kernel is assisting in providing the abstraction for those things. Right. There's always gonna be people who will be like, none of these abstractions work for me. I wanna program the TCAM from user space and get out of the friggin' way of me, mm -hmm. right? And then there's other people who are like, I really wanna use something standardized because I don't wanna have to change this when I change NICs next month. Right. So there are all these competing issues and you can't ignore any of them at this point. That's part of the problem. Um, I agree that things like th that, that slide you had with the e-tool output, like if that doesn't convince you that there's an issue, I don't know what will. <laughs> this also goes back to your favorite topic, which is documentation for driver interfaces. Yeah, we can start there. I think that can help. Like we don't, like to a certain extent, you could say we don't even know what we got. Right, yeah, it's hard to tell what you've got, and uh, you know, I encourage you to find me afterwards or send me an email if you have some good ideas in this space. I would love to try and help drive, uh, drive some uh, momentum in this space. So uh, you would have wanted to told me that like, to a certain extent we have a lot of kernel doc stuff that just isn't integrated properly, yeah. and that's probably a good starting point. Yeah, I hope that, that yeah, we can move to d documentation and more, right? Uh, I would really like for us to be able to get the panacea of having um, you know, there was a talk earlier about P4 and how it works when it integrates into BPF, but uh, 
the, the one of the problems there is that P4 can express um, parser pipelines in the language, and I don't think that translates into BPF yet very well today. It's so, the same situation like a compiler translates a C program with loops and higher level constructs into an intermediate language which loses that information and you you can't you don't have the high level look of what everything was doing exactly it's like it's like assembly code right we Try want to go that, back to C yeah how do we integrate that to right. to go from top to bottom right, right. We've, we're, we're working hard on the top and the middle but uh, there's a lot of stuff left on the table and I think performance too um, at this point, so uh, I'd also I also will reveal a secret for the whole room. <laughs> Just like testing patches that add tests, patches that improve documentation may bypass certain filters in my mind <laughs> from time to time. So I want to make sure that there is no barrier to entry or roadblocks for getting documentation fixes in. Please submit them. More test cases, more documentation. Let's do it. Totally agree there. Absolutely. So are there any other questions that Dave can throw a square ball at you? You can hand it, <laughs> hand it nearby. So the whole row is ready. <laughs> Just keep okay. going down the line. Um, so a couple of points or comments. The, the first one you, you picked on the TC hybrid offload. So, so I did that, but it also came with an entire user stack and loot user files mm -hmm. and a library on top of it. Right. And so when you ask, like, how do you know how big the TCAM was? How do you know what it supported? It's because we built the knowledge into the application above. So at, at some point, I question, uh, are we looking at this at the wrong, wrong level? As kernel developers, you want to put everything in the kernel. And yes, we're exposing complex stuff, but why don't we write better tools? And the case in point would be TC, right? Like, we, we know this tool is bad. Everyone's complained about it. It's, the options are only known by a handful of people. But it's been 10 years of complaining, and no one's decided, oh, let me write a better tool. Because the, the actual Netlink interface is not the problem. The problem is the, is the tooling. So right. I, I wonder if some of these offload problems and how we expose them are because as kernel developers, we keep adding kernel features and we don't have anyone on top trying to build the abstraction that says, hey, if I want to run in whatever, you, you could do a very high level thing and say, is this, uh, is this a data center computer? All right, here's your handful of defaults for data centers. Is this a whatever? Here's my handful of defaults. You could do automatic tuning at the user space level with the offloads that we have and never show it in my opinion, I think we sort of failed if a user is sitting at the CLI and running ETH tool, right? <laughs> there should be something better for the users. Uh, I also think that from, from a certain perspective, we designed the kernel bits with TC in mind. Yeah. Like, we're like, oh, I know how I can implement access to this feature from user space, off I go, and it's just, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And I totally agree with you that our tooling is kind of stinky. Uh, we're running into the same problem with BPF. We're always talking about how it's it's hard, it's intractable for new developers. Right. The same perspective, configuring network devices with advanced offloading features is more difficult than it really needs to be. And maybe it's as much a tooling issue as it is a what what abstractions that we provide in the kernel issue. That's a good point. Right. I think there's a couple questions in the back. Mr. Rose. Thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I worked, worked, worked with you in the past on some of these offloads, and it was fun. Uh, I, I remember at the time one common problem, and it's been suggested here, is that uh, uh, there's so many options you can set up conflicting options. And so many times we'd be in a support situation. Somebody has uh, set up their hardware in some way with uh, offloads that make no sense. This just makes no sense to have this offload going along with this one. and. Uh, there's very few controls to prevent people from, you know, you, we try. I mean, we're all, I, I remember we were always adding warnings and, you know, uh, returning failures, doing what we can to keep people from, you know, messing up their configuration. Uh, at the time, though, I, I, I still always like to look at things from a use case standpoint. And if we could just develop a tool where people could pick from a menu of common standard use cases for their particular type of networking situation, and then just apply this profile, a template, and they can modify it and, and, and do whatever they want. They can add new templates, of course, and things like this. But it's, it's this situation you guys are talking about. The tools are just, I, I was trying to figure out TC here recently, and, <laughs> and yeah, it was, uh, it was a challenge. So I think something where you just, you, you, you give hints and provide templates and profiles, 
Right, yeah, we it's need something like... It's a direction like, the tools would, we, we'd like to get them to go that way. Yeah, the, the grand, um, round, unified networking tool. The, yes. the grunt, yeah. <laughs> so we we're, we're also have a lot of self-inflicted wounds because what do we tell a driver or author who tries to add a custom way to configure crap on their device? We say, please don't do this. Make a generic facility. Guess what? We have a rainbow of generic facilities now as a yeah. result of that pushback. No, no, so no debug FS, no sysfs. So Raise your hand if you heard that. <laughs> so we've invested a lot of effort in getting people to do the right thing, and then we don't invest a lot of effort in making sure the thing they come up with is homogenous with the other stuff we have already. That right. is where we're weak. Yeah. And that's where we end up with a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's kind of the looking forward thing that I was trying to, like, you know, we should try and meet and think about or have a discussion on IRC or something where we think about what's coming a little bit and will it fit or where could it fit, right? Because then you can help target people who have spare cycles to work on open source software. If we can actually document what we have already, then we can plan for the future. That would be an excellent starting point, as you said. Yes, I agree. Anyone else? This fantastic standing room only crowd. Yeah, thanks again for coming, everyone. Appreciate those standing in the back. I know it's hot and standing. So just small comment. So as you mentioned, uh, as a hardware vendor, it's also hard to decide what to do. So if there's like documentation, you know, in, in Linux that says, these are the things that we think hardware should do, and these are the things that Linux really wants to use, that would be really helpful as well. Right. So my favorite one is, uh, please do not account transmit work in your nappy polling function. Where is that, yeah, docu where's totally that document? Where's that document? down. Yeah. Where is that document? <laughs> what? And I say it every time I see a, a new driver that doesn't implement that properly. So this it's is on film now. What? It's on film now. Yeah, we recorded it for you. It's permanent. So everyone who rides a Linux driver has to like watch this uh, yeah, presentation. Yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> totally start with this. If you're if you're writing offloads, you should totally look at this talk, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steven. Oh, the network plumber. I, I guess the only thing I would observe from seeing the slide is ETH tool has outgrown its bridges by a long way. Thank um, you. Yes, um, I agree. Maybe we should just attack the first one and you know figure out a way to to extend it because you know you know we have all these options of things on the interfaces with Netlink and tunnels and all these things and it doesn't seem anywhere near as painful because people only go down that rat hole when they need to and versus this one with the hardware offloads were kind of like exposing our drawers to everybody all the time. Right, right. Like uh, deferred down the hill, the net link conversion of ETH tool and moving into dev link or whatever we're going to do with the existing functionality. So it's been hard to move forward because people like, we haven't done the conversion, but I need this new feature and ETH tool seems like the way to go. So we've kind of right. deadlocked people in a way that's kind of unfair to people trying to actually get work done. And that, that's a failure on our part, actually. Hey. <laughs> so thanks for highlighting the DevLink param stuff. I think that was the first step down that direction. I mean, we, we looked at it because we wanted to try to have a way to express the ability to not have a proprietary tool to do a certain amount of settings that were stored in NVRAM. And so we went down that route. And and it was because, hey, we're not taking any more stuff to ETH tool. We're not going to set any more params. We're not going to do any of this stuff. Because there was some rudimentary capabilities that weren't going to grow. So we're hopeful. I mean, I'm hopeful that that will be something that people will think about in the future in a way to go. Yeah, that's actually, a, it's, a, it's a great new way of configuring stuff that's kind of more permanent, but is associated at a pretty, pretty coarse granularity. Like I said, at, you know, at the PCI Express device is about as deep as you can go to configure. So if it's chip wide, then great. If it's per port, eh. <laughs> but yeah, I, I actually see some use cases for us going forward too to use it. So it's one of those things that snuck in when I wasn't looking. Cool. All right. Thank you very much, Jesse. That was a great presentation. Thanks.